Yeah, thank you very much for being here. Um, I hope this microphone is on so whoever is recording will be recording this fine. But um, So also thanks for everybody watching this. Um, what we are going to talk about today is um, a perspective on text extraction, information extraction, which tries to get a little bit out of the um, NLP, the, the technological or the, the linguistic perspective, and also look at it from a point of view of the social sciences of what we are doing with the text extraction when um, we are uh, processing large amounts of text. Because our starting point was that, in a way, text has always been a key information source, right? If we are interested in um, very many things, we turn to text. If we just want to know um, what we know about things, what other people have already found out about things, we uh, turn to text, and all those books are by now digitized. Uh, if we want to know what's going on in the world, we turn to text. If we want to understand how people are discussing things, we can turn to newspapers, for instance, that report about this stuff. And um, all these newspapers are, again, now available digitally. We can be interested in planning processes. We can be interested in argumentation processes. We can, argument, uh, can be interested in, um, you, um, uh, well, basically, in opinions that people have, ideas that people um, present. Um, even the behavior of people is nowadays partly recorded in a textual format. So basically, almost all kind of questions that we can have in the social sciences, and also beyond the social sciences, very many questions that we have in real life are things for which we turn to text. And that, of course, means that the processing of all those texts in a text analysis and information extraction has been growing very fast and has been a very important thing uh, to develop. And uh, our starting point for this um, project for this um, um, development here is that there is a little bit of a gap between what we normally can find easily by using the tools that are available and what we really would like to find. So for instance, uh, if we look at existing technology in text extraction and information extraction, um, one of the things that we're pretty good at is finding stuff. Right? I mean, obviously Google made a, this a business model and became very rich doing this, but in very many cases also complex um, tasks for finding specific entities, for finding specific locations in a text. That's something we're pretty good at. We can um, filter and aggregate a lot of things very efficiently. So for instance, sentiment analysis has been developing quite a lot in the last years. Um, there are summarization techniques so I can find specific topics uh, and see what people are saying about those topics and basically write this down in a more efficient format. Very interesting, very useful. I can find bigger patterns where I'm not really interested in specific content anymore, but more in the arrangement of content in the patterning of things and use this, for instance, to classify documents that show similar uh, patterns can use this to check whether Shakespeare really wrote what Shakespeare says Shakespeare wrote. Um, all these things are very fascinating, but they are not normally the kind of questions that we ask when we approach text from a social science perspective. So, for instance, when we want to find things, it does happen that we have a very specific question where we just want to find a specific article, and then Google Scholar is an awesome thing because it finds the article very well. But most often what we try to find are like fuzzy entities, arguments, higher order semantic constructs, kinds of um, ways of talking about um, current issues. Um, we very often don't know exactly what we are looking for. We know what kind of thing we're looking for. And when we see it, we can say, OK, that wasn't what I was looking for, or that was. But these are things that are defined by the structure of, um, of talk, structure of text, and not so much by the content. And these we are much worse at finding so far. If we want to summarize things, filter, summarize, aggregate things, we're normally not just interested in things like sentiment. And sentiment is nice, you know, knowing whether the mood on a forum or uh, in the news or whatever is positive or negative uh, is a nice thing to have. The problem is the mood in the news is always negative. That's how the news is. So that doesn't really give us terribly much. So the interesting question is, what is it more negative about? Under which circumstances does it become more negative? Um, also, if we want to look at specific attributions, under which circumstances do which kind of people attribute what kind of qualities to what kind of uh, issues or objects, that's more a kind of question. So we're looking for these connections between um, 
all the uh, contents that we can find. And again, this is something where existing technology has a tendency to stop at a certain point. It becomes difficult. And if we're looking for, uh, for specific patterns and um, uh, like uh, um, regularities in text, we are not normally interested when it happens again, but we're not normally interested in classifying documents, but we're normally interested in classifying things within documents that are not bounded in a particularly clear way. So the document as a unit or um, the, the paragraph as a unit is not really what we're interested in if we're looking for arguments or if we're looking for things like frames uh, as a concept, like contextualization of issues. Um, if we're looking for pragmatic contents, which is what we're going to do today, um, what language does, what is being expressed in text as a request, as a call for action, that is something that is not terribly easily recognized as a pattern within a given unit. So we need to have a slightly different approach. So the starting point for this uh, entire project was that there is a little bit of a gap between the existing tools that we have and the scientific inquiry trying to use those because we can operationalize, for instance, actors as named entities to some extent. But they're not really the same thing. There are a number of ways of referring to actors that aren't named entities. And there are a number of things that are misclassified. That's a smaller problem, right? Sentiment is not the same thing as an evaluation. You can use positive sentiment words to pass a negative evaluation. Yeah, irony would be a classic case, but there are very many ways of doing this. The topic models get us beautiful things that look a lot like topics, but they aren't quite the same thing as topics. If you read a text and you have the topic model extracted from a body of text next to it, you see there's a difference. It's not exactly the same thing. So what we are interested in is trying to get these two things closer to one another and to find ways of bringing the technology that we have closer to the question that we would want to really answer. So when we depart from NLP, natural language processing, which is um, if you, would, if you want, like the, at the intersection of uh, computer science, linguistics, and statistics, and you see there is no social science in there quite yet. What we're trying to do is um, use the existing tools, these are some that we're using, um, and look at them from a perspective that takes into account the social science questions, and in this case, communication research. In particular, what we're doing, what, I'm, what we're going to present here today, is um, questions that come out of a project that you already see in the logo, InfoCore. InfoCore stands for Informing Conflict Prevention, Response, and Resolution, the role of the uh, media and violent conflict. And it's basically, it's a big political science, communication, science, conflict studies research network that comprises all those universities that you can see here. Uh, we're a big team. We are processing very many um, texts with questions like, what kind of uh, um, views do social media texts present of the enemy? What kinds of solutions are being advocated in the newspapers? How are, being, how are specific ideas for resolving a conflict discussed and possibly dismissed in a parliamentary debate? And you see these are things that are thing, uh, questions that can be answered by turning to text, but they don't map quite so well on the tools that we have. And um, what we do here is that we um, pick out um, or, or maybe first, um, we're looking at six conflicts here. Kosovo, Macedonia, Israel, Palestine, uh, Syria, Congo, and Burundi. And we're looking at, as I already alluded to, texts that are very heterogeneous in nature. We have strategic communication output, so that's PR, propaganda, all that stuff that governments, NGOs, and so on churn out and try and make sense of conflicts, tell us what it's all about, what should be done about it. We look at news coverage of those conflicts. So what is popularized as the kind of the, the mainstream uh, interpretation or community specific interpretations of these conflicts. What's going on in social media? How do people respond to all these debates? How do they fuel their own debates? And what do they argue about? And political communication here is mostly the debate in parliaments and uh, political forums. So the idea is what happens with all that information that turns it into policy or into conflict prevention and management? And um, what we're particularly interested here in here is um, calls for action. 
because you can easily imagine that in conflict research that is a very critical question, right? What kind of solutions, what kinds of actions are being called for in a, in a conflict? Are there newspapers that call up people to go take the knife and murder the neighbors? Are there um, situations where um, there is a widespread consensus in the news that uh, we should all, you know, calm down and not uh, escalate a conflict and uh, start finding a peaceful solution. Are there propositions uh, in a debate that might turn into radicalized violent action, which again may fuel conflict? So these are all things that we're interested in. What are people saying that needs to be done about the conflict? And that's basically something that we, from a social science perspective, we call calls for action. And we brought, brought you a short definition of calls for action here. Um, calls for action are an expression of a request or desire for a specific cause of action with the aim of changing the current improvable or undesirable state. So if I'm unhappy with what is currently the case, what needs to be done to get to a state that is fine? Or maintaining the current desirable state against threatening deterioration. So, you know, we are fine, but if we don't do a certain something, then this might actually stop and we will have a problem, we will have conflict. So what do we need to do in order to either uh, achieve a desirable state, whatever that is, or to prevent an undesirable state? So these calls for actions consist of a definition of what needs to be acted upon. What is it that we are concerned about? Something that we propose to act, a specific course of action, and the motivational force. So some of these elements are um, more easily mappable on linguistic theories or in, on tools than others. But uh, this is basically our starting point, and I'll turn over here to Katja, who will explain to you what exactly we have been doing and where we stand. Oh, the microphone is clearly working. <laughs> Go. Hello. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so yeah, just, just, just to um, uh, cap, uh, sum up a little bit what Christian just said. So we're interested in uh, those sentences in texts that express calls for action, and we're aiming at developing uh, an automatic tool that will extra extract them from texts automatically. We will use uh, natural language processing techniques, uh, namely machine learning. And um, it can be formulated as a classification task, uh, which will be performed in two steps. In first step, we will extract sentences that I like we will classify sentences as ones calling for action or not calling for action. And then in the second step, those that do call for action, we will classify them based on what exactly is being called for. So I will walk you through all these steps. But first of all, let me give you like a good sense of what exactly we mean by calls for action, what exactly we are looking for in texts. Uh, so calls for action, they can be expressed uh, explicitly, like pretty much straightforward, or they can be hidden. And we are interested in both ways. So let's first look at the explicit ones. Uh, there are a number of ways in natural language that express uh, this sort of information that call for, for action. First of all, it's with the means of specific words, like command, request, demand, right? Like these ver ver verbs, like very straightforward, say that something needs to be done. As an example here, Chad has called for the humanitarian community su to support the government uh, in dealing with the influx of Nigerian refugees. We have uh, the expression has called for or to call for in an infinitive, which is pretty much straightforward, says us what, that something is being called for. Uh, another way to express this information would be to use modal verbs that oblige someone to do something. So for English, those would be must, need to, have to, ought to, should. Uh, it can be just like one model verb. Uh, there can be a negator, like should not. In that case, it will be a call for not doing something. So like if we have negators, it doesn't mean that there is no call for action. It is still there, but just that the call is for not performing specific things. Uh, another example when uh, calls for action are still expressed explicitly, but it's a bit trickier because there are no specific words here, but it's in grammar. So like uh, for English, like here it is like imperative mood, right? Like I guess most languages, to the best of my knowledge, all of the languages have uh, specific grammar ways to express imperative mood. Uh, in English, it would be omitting the subject and placing the verb in the first place, like fight them. Uh, or another example, which is a bit more interesting, fire. Uh, 
which, which is ambiguous. And here we're starting dealing with uh, uh, the fact that natural language is very ambiguous. So it can be a verb, it can be synonymous to shoot, right? Like fire, so I call for someone shooting at someone. But I can also exclaim fire, meaning that, hey guys, there is a fire here, so we need to run away, it's dangerous, which will be a noun. And this information is actually available only from the context. So like right now, it's really hard to say what I meant. So we only really need, need to know when the sentence was exclaimed, written, uttered, and what is the context. Yes. Yes. We already did it to the optimal, yeah. So probably, yeah. Sorry, like. I don't know if we try to not not no, it won't work either. If but the slides, the presentations will be available through the recording, right? So if you want to later read yeah. up. Yeah, I'm I'm so sorry about this. So <laughs> <laughs> probably you have to listen to me a bit more. Then. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the next, uh, the next thing that we are also trying uh, to catch, not only those calls for action that are very straightforward in the text, but also that are Im implicit, that were just hidden, meant. Like these are very common in uh, parliamentary debates, for example, like politicians, they probably not always like to say directly, let's go and kill someone, but they like to say, okay, probably let, let, let's do something bad for someone, but then actually I didn't mean it, and then I meant it again, so, you know, to, to leave the room for different interpretations. Like for us, like we still want to know about those calls for action, they're still interesting. Uh, uh, so here I will show you where, where is the fine line which is still considered to be a call for action, which is not. Because like, again, if you uh, address different linguistic um, theories, like um, speech act theory, basically every sentence can call for something. Like, so we need to really draw a fine line for us and for computers to better understand what uh, we're interested in and what we're not interested in. Uh, so first of all, uh, we consider those sentences that um, communicate dissatisfaction with the current situation to call for something. Like the idea is that if someone is not happy with the current state of affairs, then most likely the person will want to do something, will ask someone to do something, will perform some action to get to better situation, to better future, to, to get the desirable outcome. Uh, it can be expressed with specific verbs, for example, like as here with the words meaning condemn, blame, or like set expressions, idiomic, idiomatical expressions can be used, like we will not sit with folded hands. Uh, and actually this can be proved uh, that these sentences indeed call for action, we can rephrase them, we can rephrase them with the help of modal verbs, like we can say, uh, this motion should not be happening, or like so someone should not do something, where we're getting to a more classical way of expressing this sort of information. Uh, there are uh, expressions that still use like the same lexical tools, like, like modal verbs, for example, but they don't call for specific action. They just say, okay, something should be done, some steps needs to be ta need to be taken, some actions should be taken. So this is also very interesting for us, like probably, again, in political communication, for example, uh, no specific uh, course of action can be advanced, but still some, like the idea that some action will follow is there, and we're also interested in capturing this. Um, this information can also be expressed uh, with the help of questions, like rhetorical questions, as here, can we accept such a treatment? Right, so asking, can we accept it, or shall we do something that this treatment does not happen? Shall we, uh, like, so we basically call for uh, either those people who perform unfavorable action to change it, unfavorable treatment, or we ourselves will do something to change it to, uh, to better uh, situation. Um, and the last example on this slide, um, it's like propositions about desirable states. For example, peace is the only answer. Yeah, so th this is in a pretty hidden way calls for peace. So either we have a war currently and let's change it to the state of peace or the peace is already established, let's just maintain it. So. Um, here uh, we also have like like semas that signal about this sort of information, like something is the only answer, so the only answer, the only solution to a problem. So hopefully you more or less get what we are trying to catch in the texts, so you, you know what we are looking for. Uh, uh, so the next thing uh, to do is to, uh, yeah, like I want to introduce some, some uh, the, our data which we are working on and the tools that we are using. Uh, so first of all, we uh, 
borrowed this nice uh, open source tool, AMCAT, which stands for Amsterdam Content Analysis Toolkit, which was developed in Amsterdam, obviously, uh, and for University of Amsterdam by Wouter van Atefeld and his team. Uh, and we adjusted it to our needs. Uh, we put it in Jerusalem. We call it JAMCAT, uh, which has nothing to do with Jerusalem AMCAT server, but with the JAMCAT, actually. Uh, so we adjusted to our needs. Uh, stored our data there. Uh, it also hosts some other projects, not only InfoCore, also Record. Like actually, it's open source. Everyone can get account there if Christian and I agree on that. Uh, so we just put all our data there. Uh, this is the overview of the corpus that we are using. Already Christian mentioned that we uh, address to four different communication spheres, namely political communication, strategic communication, conventional media, and social media. Uh, we have uh, nearly two million texts currently. The most represented sphere is uh, news, news, like uh, conventional news, newspapers, basically. Uh, then we have social media and strategic communication, parliamentary debates. So this is the corpus that we are working with, which we want to analyze, where we want to extract our cause for action from. Now, uh, as I said, we want to use machine learning. So we want to, le to train a statistical al uh, model, statistical algorithm, to ex do it automatically. The algorithm needs something to learn from. It needs labeled data. It needs, needs training corpus. That's what we also did. Uh, we crafted a call for action corpus. Uh, so we basically query the same uh, four types of documents uh, with a time range uh, January, March 2015 with the search to terms war, violence, and conflict. Uh, so we got all possible texts. Then we split them into sentences, and each sentence was labeled accordingly. Either it calls for action or no, and those that are calling, they were also classified, which I will, will be the second part of my talk today. So we have 5,000 sentences currently labeled. Uh, yeah, like basically the, the shares are more or less the same as the overall corpus. Uh, the richest in terms of um, uh, agendas for uh, calls for action is strategic communication, then it's news media and political communication, and the social media surprisingly express uh, the less number of calls for action. And uh, on average, calls for action comprise 30% of all texts. So 30% of our corpus is basically calling for something. Uh, so this is uh, what our algorithm will learn from. But those are just sentences, right? And computers that somehow, unfortunately, are not very good at understanding words. They need numbers. So our sentences, they have to be preprocessed in a specific way to become readable for computers. And yeah, probably don't see anything. <laughs> um, so when we deal with machine learning, it means that we need to extract specific features which will be used as learning material for the algorithm to label unseen data. And I will walk you through uh, some steps, which let's say state of the art in natural language processing and computational linguistics. Some of them we did perform, some of them we didn't. So the first one, uh, it's called like n-grams extraction. So we will want to ex extract n-grams from our text. Probably the best way to explain what n-grams are is to give an example. So if you have an example sentence, frost cone meets science, and we want to extract unigrams where n equals one, we will also can kind of call that we will be dealing with back of words. So we will basically have three tokens, frost cone meets science, like three words, a simple token, this will be the units of our analysis. If our n equals two, then we will be dealing with bigrams, and we will have uh, units as frost cone meets, meets science, and frost cone science. If we have n equals three, then it will be frost cone meets science. So the whole sentence will be treated as one unit of analysis. Uh, but still, this seems to be like just, just words, right? Like probably the computer won't get uh, if it's like one word or two words. So we still need to, to get some scores. And uh, we uh, normally get TF-IDF scores, which stand for terms frequency, uh, inverse document frequencies. Uh, yeah, probably you don't really see the formula here, but it's like very easy and it's uh, like it will be the only formula for today, so no worries, I won't torture you with many of them. So in order to compute this course, the formula consists of two parts. So the left part uh, is like we need to get uh, the number of occurrences of each word and divide it by the total number of words in the sentence. And then we will multiply it. Uh, the second part is um, 
the number of sentences divided by the number of sentences that that term occurs. We take logarithm of that, we multiply the, those two parts, and we get the, get the score. So all those units of analysis from the previous slides, all our n-grams, they will be represented as a vector of uh, scores, TFIDF scores. Why don't we deal with just occurrences? Well, there are good reasons for that, uh, because like some words are more informative, some words are less informative, some words occur more often in the sentence and they might be less informative. Sentences can be of different lengths. So all those things they uh, accounted for in this formula. Uh, another three common uh, normalization steps in the natural language processing are stop words removal, stemming and limitization. Uh, so stop word removal um, means that we basically get rid of uh, like small words that occur very often in texts, but that don't uh, bear any semantic information and probably they don't contribute to classification. Those are like words as like uh, articles, add their preposition, particles, uh, connectors like or and some auxiliary verbs. So it's uh, usually like when we're dealing with uh, large text classification, uh, it's really increases the performance. Like a second step is uh, stemming. Uh, when we bring all uh, words in our text to its stem. So as an example here, uh, terrorism, terrorist and terrorize will be brought to uh, terror. So we get rid of suffixes and keep the root only and analyze only the roots, which also makes sort of sense, right? Because the core meaning is there in the root and like we, when we want to decide whether the text belongs to the topic war or to the topic sports, that should suffice. The third very common step is limitization, uh, which is a soft version of stemming, when we don't get rid of suffixes, or, but we just bring all the terms to its canonical normal form. So for example, we'll get rid of tenses, like M being where like all different variations of verbs will be brought to be, or all nouns, like uh, we disregard if it's singular or plural, we just use the plural. So document and documents will be limitized to document. As I said, like when we deal with a, a large text classification problem, this really helps. Like there are lots of papers, experiments uh, showing that uh, it holds. But in our case, uh, as I said, like we are classifying sentences, which is a very short piece of text, right? And when you, if you, if you recall, uh, like the, those slides where I was giving you examples of calls for action, you might have noticed that actually the call for action sometimes it, this information is concentrated in words like request, but very often it is concentrated in uh, like grammar, right? So we need like this grammar imperative. We need the connections between words. So in our case, we did not perform any of the steps. Uh, we tried. Uh, it decreased the performance, um, and. Uh, Right now, I will give you, try to give you the sense uh, why it was important not to perform them, and moreover, to weight up this grammar information to give more importance to those like tiny little uh, sort of meaningless words. Uh, we develop linguistic features, so we, which we will be using together with all the previous. So we will we are using n-grams. In our case, we are using n-grams with n between one and four. We computed TFIDF scores for all of them. So this is our let's say the first set of features. Then on top of that, we develop 32 linguistic features. I won't just list them, but I will also again give you a couple of examples to show why we developed them and why they are important. And actually, uh, including them uh, improved the performance of the classifier. Well, there are lots of examples here. Like probably you will be able to read them some way, some somehow between the the, uh, the lines, the flickers. So two examples. Uh, he needs to help the refugees, and the needs of all the refugees cannot be met. Hopefully by now you are also almost experts on calls for action, and you agree with me that the first second sentence, he needs to help the refugees, does call for action, while the second one does not. But we have the word needs in both cases. And like it's very likely the classifier, like just 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 judging based on these two words, will assign the same label to these two sentences. Especially if we get rid of those small, tiny, and informative words as articles, it's very likely that they will be classified in the same way. So how can we deal with this problem? And the answer is we need to have part of speech information. So we used part of speech tagger, namely we use Stanford Core NLP, which performs not only tagging but also it extracts other useful linguistic information like grammar. Uh, uh, dependency tree, grammar parsing, uh, and, and the, the sentence that does call for action needs is a verb, while in the second sentence is a noun. So we use this information to disambiguate these two sentences. Another example, basically the same. The request a ceasefire versus user's request is being processed. 
Again, request in both sentences. The first one is a verb. It does call for action. The second one is a noun. It does not call for action. And most likely, uh, the, like given this information, most likely our classifier will get the labels correctly. Now, let's have a look at more tricky example. Uh, the tanks must be withdrawn versus it must be called. So we have must be and must be on the left hand side and on the right hand side. So like even if we use bigrams, we will still be dealing with the same entities. All of them are verbs, so parts of speech won't help here. So what to do? And the answer is we have to look at the grammar relationship with the neighboring words. So we have to look which words are our like hint verbs connected to. So in the first case, it is connected to past participle, must be withdrawn. In the second case, it is connected to adjective. So the feature we will develop will basically try to capture those, those issues when the hint word, word is connected to past participle or when a hint word is connected to an adjective. So checking for a part of speech of the dependent word, basically. Uh, similar example, we must not lower our guard at any time, Prime Minister Manuel Valls told Parliament, adding that serious and very high risks remain, versus this certainly must not feel so bad. The same example, we have must not in one sentence, we have must not in another sentence. So in order to disambiguate these two guys, we really need, we also have to look at words uh, and specifically what's, what verbs they are connected to. So we have to restrict, uh, the, the we have to create a specific list of verbs which will signal us about either positive cause for action or negative ones. Another example, to call for peace and a call for your sister or to call on the phone, right? So probably right now you already know what, what the answer will be. In the first case, we're dealing with the verb. In the second case, like a call for your sister, even though we have the same combination of a, ver of a word and a preposition, but we really need to know the part of speech. So the verb, the sentence with the verb will be calling for something and the other one won't. Uh, to call on the phone, here, like, the call is still the verb, but it is connected to different prepositions. So we, again, the, having the information on the neighboring words and what sort of relationship they are with, uh, uh, with our main word will answer the question, will solve the problem. This is the only answer versus the only answer I have is that I simply didn't know. Here we have three words in both sentences uh, that are the same, so even three grams won't help us here. Uh, but that's a, that's a hard case and probably not every classifier will be able to assign labels correctly. Uh, the features that are supposed to capture these cases, again, like we look at the um, position in the sentence, so whether it is an object or a subject. Which, uh, it, if it is an object, uh, is it an object of the verb to be, which is called corpula verb, or is it an object of a different verb? Uh, all that information comes in handy and hopefully our classifiers, like having all that uh, linguistic knowledge, will be able to make the right decision, but this is already like a pretty hard case. The last but not the least on this slide, the time to stop killing is now versus it takes long time to stop killing, right? Time to, time to. Uh, similar, the same, same expressions, different meaning. Uh, and again, we look at the uh, words that are connected to those, like for example, when uh, the word time is modified by adjectives as long or short or right, uh, then it's not calling for something, it's, or it's very likely not to call for something. Or if time is an object of the word take or request, then again, it is not calling for anything, while, well, but if we have just like time to, and then especially if we have a verbal uh, complement uh, following uh, our hint noun, then we will very likely classify it as cause for action. So hopefully now you're convinced that uh, for our task it's a good idea to leave those small informative words and maybe like even uh, get a bit more, give a bit more weight to them. Uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to say about our features that we used, we also used uh, the data origin, so the, where, where our data comes from, from which communication sphere as a, as a feature. And the intuition behind is that language on Twitter, for example, and language is new in newspapers, in parliamentary debates, they are very different. Like Twitter, you have uh, limited lengths, people have lots of misspellings, uh, acronyms, abbreviations, while, like, for example, like we have lots of uh, texts from British parliamentary debates where the language like is very polite and very ambiguous, and, like every sentence is started with my honorable friend and so on and so forth. So like, like ho hopefully our classifiers will be able to uh, capture the differences and uh, make use of this information to make decisions. 
So we have our corpus, we have our features. Now let's move to the algorithms. Uh, there are numerous of them. In machine learning, I don't know, very many of them. Uh, some of them perform better for specific tasks. Uh, we use three. Uh, if you ask me why only three, well, we read many papers uh, who recommend that this algorithm perform the best for text classification tasks. We ran a couple of experiments. They supported the paper results. So indeed, like three algorithms, naive base, k-nearest neighbors, and support vector machines perform the best for, for, for the tasks. I will walk you very briefly through, through all of them, through their logics. So naive base is very simple. Uh, let's imagine that our task is uh, to classify a text uh, if it belongs to cars, sports, or if it's a detective story. So what naive bias does, uh, first it places a new item, a new unseen piece of data into the class with the most probable label. So in this case, these are cars. Then it looks at the next word, and the next word is dark. Okay. If we have a dark, then this feature is very likely to occur in the class about detective story. So then probably it text does not belong to cars, but to detective story. Let's look at the next word in the text, and that's football. Okay, probably no texts about cars and detective contain the word football, but like very likely that many, many texts about sport will contain this verb. So it means that the label sport is the most probable and eventually the new text will be assigned that label because that feature was the most probable. That's how Bayes makes decision. The next algorithm, k nearest neighbors, uh, it works in the following way. Uh, it computes the distance to k nearest neighbors of a new item, unseen item, and then it decides that this item belongs uh, to the class to which the majority of those neighbors belong to. So if the majority belongs to cars, then this new one also belongs to cars, and so on and so forth. The good thing about this classifier is that it can make decisions, um, like not, not non-linear decisions. So as here, you might notice in the picture, it's like, like more or less shapes, rounds, so like when the data is not linearly separatable, it can handle those cases. Uh, unlike support vector machine, uh, which is a linear classifier, so it works very well uh, when our data can be separated by a straight line. It's also called large margin classifier, and the intuition behind it is that if we have two data sets, or like two, two classes of our data, uh, probably you can catch it from, from, from this picture here, uh, so it will try to, we, we can draw the line to separate our data in multiple ways, right? But like, it will try to draw it in such a way that the distance between each data item and the line is, is maximized. So that when we have new unseen data, it's very likely that it will fall on the right label, on the right category. Even though it's linear classifier, but somehow it also performs rather well for nonlinear problems. Uh, and like actually, this is the classifier that showed the best performance in our case, and that's the one that we are using for for our for our task. Uh, well, oh look, it, it, you can see it, right? Cool. Uh, the problem is fixed. Uh, so these are the squares for uh, three classifiers with different sets of features. So here you have naive base, here you have support vector machines, k nearest neighbors. Uh, the top line is three. Um, uh, groups of feature, uh, then it's two groups of feature, and only TF, IDF. The best one, as I said, the, the SVM, it performs the best, uh, reaching accuracy around 0 0.8 in most cases. Like some, sometimes it's a bit less on some categories, sometimes it's a bit higher, but generally speaking, it's the best one. Uh, and actually, it performs rather well even without our linguistic features. So one may ask, why, why bother then? Why developing those complicated features? And actually, the answer is here uh, because it makes the algorithm more powerful. Like I don't know, like sort of short of time, so I will just briefly mention that uh, if you if you try to draw the performance of your classifier in learning curves, uh, this one where we're using three sets of feature, like it, you can see that two lines go like this. It means the classifier, like and this one, they are not parallel, but like the gap is very high. So this one is the signals about high variance, while the, it means that it cannot generalize very well and the new data cannot be classified as well. While here, when we, when we see the curves are going like this, this is a good signal. It means that our model is rather powerful, more powerful than, than this one. So actually including linguistic feature makes sense. Uh, that's the uh, 
big problem that we sort of solved. We learned to extract calls for action from texts, but then I said it's also very interesting to know what exactly is being called for, right? It's very important to know whether we want to start a war or whether we want to maintain peace. So the classification that we developed, um, uh, it includes cooperative treatment, which, have, which has two subcategories, either calling for peace or de-escalation, or calling for like support, help, it can be financial support and well be, can be humanitarian support. Um, it is restricted treatment, which has uh, three subcategories, uh, calling for violence solution, for escalation of conflicts, calling for punishment and investigation, like it can be like all like legal uh, acts like sentencing, sending someone to court, to jail, uh, or exclusion of protest, when we say, okay, we just let's ignore someone, don't pay attention to, to him. Uh, then we have calls for not doing something. Uh, as I also mentioned before, like we can call for, uh, like probably better to draw an example. We must not lower our guard at any time, Prime Minister Manuel Valls told, right? So we must not lower, we must not do something. And this information can also be expressed with the help of verbs as condemn uh, or warn. Uh, another category uh, is like general calls for just doing something or rhetorical questions when no specific course of, of action is mentioned, but just the idea that we need to do something. Uh, another category is when sentences call for multiple actions. Normally those are complex sentences with many clauses where each clause calls for something different. So one clause can call, call for de-escalation, another for support, and another one for sentencing, and then saying, okay, but let's just do something. Uh, and the last category, uh, rubbish bin, so to say, the other. Whenever we don't know where to, the sentence belongs to, we just assign a label other to it. As in this, this example, for example, the militants who massacre school children, the headed soldiers and attacked uh, defense installations have surely committed war crimes and must be dealt with as such. So there should be, should, should be done, something should be done. Uh, but it's very hard to say what exactly, like even for a human being, uh, we don't know exactly what is meant. Obviously those people should not be glorified because they did bad things, but should they be killed? Should be say, sent to jail or just do something? We don't know. So this is other. We also perform classification for this, uh, but here we're not doing that great yet, unfortunately. Here you can see the results, if you can see the results for the fine grain classification with nine categories. Okay, you don't see it. Well, I will just say that the scores are very low. They are, uh, normally they're uh, less than 50%. Uh, the reasons are because it's natural language, it's very ambiguous, and even for human coders, it's hard to assign a correct label. Uh, we also don't have enough data, like sometimes it's just a dozen of examples. But if we, we merge a couple of categories, like, and we deal only with four of them, then the scores are getting higher, so we have about 0.6 accuracy in average. So we have more of the data here. So probably we, we, we are improving. We hopefully will get good results one day. Uh, and one of the answers uh, that we are aiming at is to get more data. Hopefully it will help us uh, in this classification task. So to wrap up, I'm finishing. Uh, Christian started with uh, words that there is a gap between what we can do from technological point of view and what we need, what questions we have. Uh, what questions we have uh, to answer in uh, communication science. Uh, many things can already be done. Uh, but the problem is that um, Many things that we're interested in, they're hidden in the language. They are very ambiguous. And this is where the technology cannot help us yet. Like, what we tried to do here, and we reached certain results, we, uh, uh, we extracted calls for action, which is like very pragmatic, semantic, deep hidden in language information with certain, certain achievements. But there are obviously many more things to do and uh, room to improve. Uh, can calls for action be used in other areas, not only in communication science? Obviously, yes. Uh, for example, uh, we can identify user requests. Uh, it's the same, the same formulation, the same words. We can generate automatic to-do lists, like imagine the situation when you can come from vacation, you have uh, hundreds of emails and you don't have time to read all of them and you're afraid to miss important tasks or meetings and then you have a to-do list generated so you already have, you know where to do, where to go, what time you have meetings, what tasks you have, which is could be quite handy, right? 
uh, we can use it for reviews analysis. Like for example, if we have an analysis, a review of a hotel, and the guest uh, suggested to improve something, to improve the swimming pool, for example, uh, managers can easily extract this information and act upon it. Or we can use it in, uh, for example, uh, medical documents. So when doctors have like lots of lots of documents to process, they can just query them and extract uh, what treatment was recommended with the same symptoms to fasten their work. Um, what could be very useful for communication science, uh, what, what still can be done, uh, to answer our questions, we can combine different NLP tools uh, to answer our questions. So, for example, if we combine semantic role, roles labeling with uh, some lexical tools as FrameNet or WordNet, we can find evidential claims, like the claims about the truth about specific uh, object entity. We can identify interpretative frames if we have our calls for action, if we have uh, the same evidential claims, if we have sources and semantic roles. Uh, we could, in theory, uh, find uh, casual links. So again, using all those above mentioned tools, uh, we could find wh what caused what. So may, may build those casual links, casual chains of things. And of course, that's not everything. That's some couple of ideas we came up with. So maybe you have your own, which can be also very interested, interesting and valuable, and we are open for them. So that's it. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm interested in how uh, these techniques might be used, um, especially in, in supporting otherwise labour-intensive processes. I have a quite specific um, example in mind. There's a group at uh, Hanover, Medizin uh, Hochschule, um, that has been working in the last few years on um, systematic reviews, not in epidemiology, as is very common, but in ethical and philosophical literature, um, and in particular addressing um, ethical dilemmas in, in medicine, uh, for example, uh, around uh, cystic euthanasia. And uh, their modus operandi at the moment is to have um, is to have uh, trained researchers analyze um, texts which are found initially, obviously, by searching databases. But then the analysis, is, uh, thematic text analysis, done entirely manually. Um, and obviously, that's expensive if you'd like to be able to do that for all sorts of uh, policy development, um, guideline development, and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it, you, one can imagine that it's going to be hard to persuade an awful lot of bodies to pay for that. Uh, if one had um, tools to support that at least, um, yeah. so you had some some good groundwork done automatically, that would happen. Yeah. seems to be a great thing. I, I, yeah. I, I, I wonder if you see that as a fit in the, 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 for these methods. Uh. Uh, yeah, we, yeah. I repeat, I repeat the, the question. So the question is whether uh, this technology or similar technology can support in like uh, real life applications. And as exa an example was uh, like research run in uh, one of the medical universities in Germany. Uh, that there are lots of texts that currently are uh, analyzed, annotated manually, which is very expensive and time consuming. So whether we can use uh, technology for that. Uh, yeah, I think it's it, it's it's very possible, uh, especially when you said like, like there are already lots of texts that are probably manually annotated, analyzed. Then yeah, basically all the algorithms they are there, they can be used out of the box. And the main problem is uh, when it cannot be used is when we don't have labeled data. Well, this is not the case. Of course, you will have to spend some time on like trading algorithm, algorithms, adjusting them. Uh, but in principle, it is very possible. Yeah, and I think we can have very good results. And I think the the trick probably is that um, the technology can take part of the way, right? And for instance, extracting passages that we know that contain relevant information, what needs to be done, for instance, ethical recommendations. That is something that we can do with a certain high level of confidence. So we, we will miss some, but we will catch most and we'll um, reduce the time needed to find those instances quite a lot. And then... 
it's another question whether you also want to use the technology for the second step, that is reading those fragments and then deciding what exactly needs to be done because there might be a point in having the additional nuance and precision uh, that you can get with a, um, a human reader. But I mean, you know, we're working on that and basically it works the better, the fewer ambiguous cases of language use there are uh, in distinguishing different kind of recommendations. And the thing with war and conflict discourse is that things are awfully ambiguous because people strategically try to hide what exactly they are calling for, right? So if you have texts that don't try to do that, performance might be actually quite much better. All right, the question was uh, where exactly the linguistic features extraction is implemented. Uh, uh, so we are using for the whole, uh, as I mentioned, like the, let's say the big environment for all our development is the JamCut server, which is Python based. For uh, machine learning, so specifically for algorithm training, we're using uh, Python library scikit-learn. And the uh, features, uh, that's a separate model which was developed by us uh, using Stanford Core NLP to extract all those features. So we have them and we just like add them to our feature matrix basically in, uh, in at the stage of yeah when we when we extract features other features as well. Uh, so the question is if our uh, training corpus of 5,000 sentences is big enough for the algorithm to learn. Uh, not really. Uh, of course, like the more data we have, the better. Uh, but uh, for the task of just uh, disambiguating between calling for action and not, it's fine. Like I mean, we have about 80% of accuracy, which is good, which is good number. Uh, for more fine-grained classification, as uh, you probably did not see, uh, it's not enough, obviously. But the increase of data can improve, like because we started with a corpus of about 2,000 sentences and the scores were lower. Now we have 5,000, the scores got higher, and hopefully soon we will have even a bigger corpus, like we have some human coders working on annotating. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it is, it, it is enough, but the more data we get, uh, hopefully the better results we will get. With the graphs? This one, right? So the question was to bring back this slide. <laughs> So you're interested basically like in test training split, right? So yeah, the question is uh, how many sentences, which part of corpus was used for training, which one, which one for testing. So for this experiment, it's 20% split, 20% for testing and 80% for training. Okay, so what, what should we see? Do we see like, I don't know, the SVM test, what, what should we see? Uh, okay, so apparently, like the question is to elaborate more on the graphs. Uh, yeah, like what you can see, like okay, you have three bars. Uh, the the blue one is uh, the score for calls for action identification. The red one is for not calls for action, and green is average. And then you have precision recall and F1 score. So pretty standard measurements for 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 for, for, for accuracy. And uh, let's just look at the. Uh, Top, uh, top corner, like right top. So you 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 see the score. So it means that the calls for actions, ha uh, precisions for calls for action is actually actually one. Uh, the precisions for not calls for action is ar around 0 0.7, and average is close to 0 0.8. While recall for calls for action is zero, uh, recall for not calls for action is one, and average is sort of. So it's just the scores that. You to show how, how well or how bad the classifiers perform. Uh, 
Uh, so the question is uh, whether we can uh, decide in favor of different classifiers depending on which score is more important for us. In principle, yes. So if our task is, if like for whatever specific task, we are only interested in calls for action and we really want to have high precision of those, then yeah, of course, we could use uh, like the classifier that performs better for this specific task. Or if, if we don't call about calls for action and we are only interested in recall for not calls for action, then yeah, naive base will be the best. But uh, for, in our case, we're sort of interested to get the highest scores for, for all the uh, tasks, for all the entities. Uh, yeah, so that's why basically for, for our experiment we uh, chose SVM. Yeah, and uh, I guess the, the the challenge here is uh, if you rely on the, on the uh, only on the precision score here, the precision is high because it didn't catch terribly many. Right, so you know, I and mean, you see, the recall is is bad for um, for the calls for action, and that means that uh, it, there are a few calls for action that were so clear that the naive base did catch them, and they were right, but they didn't catch many. So maybe that's not the best strategy. <laughs> so the SVM performed clearly better on the whole. The question is about giving some examples that are hard to classify. Um, well, okay, you know, you you would like one would think that uh, like those ambiguous examples as fire can be hard to classify, uh, but actually that's a good question because when I was preparing the presentation, um, I looked into some misclassified examples, and um, most of the uh, misclassification were caused by imprecisions by linguistic features. So that when the Stanford coronal P assigned the part of speech tag wrongly or like some of the relations were not caught, uh, very often uh, those sentences are misclassified and then like, you know, like I, I went manually in, into my, my, my files, I changed the value for features and then the misclassification was gone. But many of the examples, like really I could not understand for, for what reason classifier decided uh, in favor of a wrong label and when like for example example, obviously must is there and it is obviously uh, calling for something but the decision was made as it was not calling for action. So uh, this is some, something like definitely uh, I will dig in deeper. Yeah, um, the question is whether the uh, tool so far works only in English. And um, it, considering that we have text in quite a bunch of languages, that's correct. We, uh, the, like the, basically the entire project InfoCool works in eight languages. And we have a, um, a huge dictionary that uh, tries to extract something like 4,000 different kind of concepts that can be mentioned in eight languages. This is a lot of fun. This tool in particular has been developed in English so far. Most of the things that it uses are in principle available for other languages too, right? I mean, if we have a proper um, tool kit for assigning part of speech, for extracting grammar information, there's no particular reason why we can't run that in Arabic too. We have not done that yet. But in principle, the technology is one that should be translatable to the extent that the languages you deal with have these features or the structures that we're looking at, and there's always an adjustment obviously needed, right? If you have a language that, for instance, uh, doesn't use like the separate words for uh, connecting or for uh, definite articles or something like that, like for instance, you have in Hebrew, you have the prefixation as um, a solution for many things, and you need to adjust the way this is done. But in principle, there's no particular reason why this needs to be restricted to English. So mm -hmm. The sort of thing I have in mind is that uh, I, th I think in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a lot of uh, debates there are sort of underlying uh, hidden texts. Mm -hmm. uh, they might be a religious or poetic. And so, for example, if you have a call to, to, to deal with these people as Judas Gold and Polyphemus, you mm -hmm. have to know what Judas mm -hmm. Gold and Polyphemus is. Mm -hmm. Another example would be um, in, in, in certain countries where um, 
speech is somewhat discouraged, mm -hmm. and social media is full of uh, rather more elusive mm -hmm. speech. And I just wonder um, how, how well your techniques deal with, with those sorts of things, because I presume they must apply in some regions you're focusing on. Mm -hmm. So the question is how the, the technology deals with ambiguity, like things like referentiality, if you have refer, basically if you externalize parts of the information to something people are supposed to know or uh, allude to things. And I guess that depends partly on how exactly this is done. Like, you know, if you have uh, um, in a training corpus, we have, have a lot of cases that are working roughly like that, then the classifier should have a pretty good chance finding it. Um, kind of refers to another project that I'm uh, currently toying with um, that is not yet in this stage, uh, where the idea is to look at the history of the same um, discourse. Right? So basically the idea is, you know, you say for instance, Katya had the example um, that those people need to, they are war criminals and they need to be treat treated as such. Right? And if you have then in the history of the discourse other texts that say that war criminals need to be treated by and then um, whatever is the locally appropriate way, hanging, shooting, uh, imprisoning, you know, there are different ways, pardoning. Um, and you, you have this kind of information from the historicity of the discourse, then you can fill this in. But this is obviously a much more complex procedure that goes far beyond uh, trigrams. Right. So it, it is something that we have on the screen, and w there is work in that area, but it is far from being in a, uh, we can present that this actually works stage. Yeah, you. Just very briefly to add uh, that here, like we deal with a sentence at the unit of analysis, so we basically we don't look uh, beyond the sentence, which is a downside, obviously, because many things are in context. Uh, and in principle, there are tools in natural language processing, like an effort resolution, for example, which can help us identify what the pronoun refers to. Uh, but like currently, like no, it's not included yet. But of course, that would be cool to do. Anyway, yeah. The, the next thing then, of course, is like, you know, every additional tool that you plug in um, multiplies error sources, right? So you have the error source of the Stanford Core NLP, then you have the stand, uh, error source of the Anaphora resolution. And if basically by the precision rates of all of these individual tools, you already get to an overall precision rate of 0.5, then it starts being useless. So there's, there's a limit. There's basically, there are some things we can do by combining these tools, but the price we pay for that is that we depend on the tools and their precision. So where the tools are not perfect, then adding one has a price. There was a comment that there is uh, a lot of work on this in the digital humanities, and it's obviously this is, it's a lot of um, both philosophical and like you know just developing the perspective of how one can try and find all these things in in texts, work dealing with irony, dealing with implicature, dealing with figurative speech, um, and also uh, quite a lot of tools. So there's a lot of stuff there. There seem to be no more acute questions. So um, I guess uh, let us thank you very much for being here and for the discussion. It's been a very big pleasure. And if you have any further questions later or whatever, this thing is online. Uh, InfoCore is online. We have email addresses and we're happy about questions, ideas, suggestions and so on. So thanks a lot. Thank you.